already know our guests this afternoon, but let me remind you of some of their accomplishments and work. Yoram Hazoni is the author of Conservatism, A Rediscovery, and The Virtue of Nationalism, among other works. He is the chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation and the president of the Herzl Foundation in Jerusalem. Charles Kessler is the author most recently of The Crisis of the Two Constitutions, The Rise, Decline, and Recovery of American Greatness. Charles is a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute and the editor of the Claremont Review of Books. So gentlemen, I thought we would begin by picking up where Charles's remarks last night left off. Um, Yoram, you're of course the, uh, you know, sort of um, leading light of uh, national conservatism, and uh, Charles is very strongly identified with the uh, sometimes called West Coast Straussian point of view, uh, certainly the uh, school of thought uh, pioneered by Harry Jaffa. And so, you know, the, uh, nationalism and uh, sort of universal values are uh, very much uh, identified with each of your different schools. And so I thought I'd ask, um, where does federalism fit into your conception of conservatism or of the American order? And maybe we'll start with Yoram. Okay, I, I should emphasize that plenty of Claremont people come and speak. Charles has spoken at, at, at NatCon, and uh, uh, I think most of us feel like it's a, it, it's a big family. We have plenty of disagreements, but it's a family. Um, so uh, federalism, I, <coughs> I, look, I think it's kind of a, it's an odd question that there, there is a kind of a, um, a universe in which um, localism and nationalism are enemies. And I, I certainly understand the theory. I don't have a problem understanding the argument, but I think in, in, in practice what we're usually dealing with is um, uh, some big imperial project, or, or maybe several, uh, where the, um, the movement for independence of various nations is itself a localism. It's local with, you know, uh, uh, um, when, when, when the Americans want their independence from the British Empire, American nationalism is with respect to, you know, British imperial ambitions, it is a localism. So the, the, the reality is that there aren't just these two levels. The reality is that, that, um, that human, human beings clump you know, first at the family level, and then kind of at the, at the at the clan or congregation level, and then at the tribal level, and then nations and families of nations, and the um, a reasonable politics is always going to have a tension between um, the national level, which has to be strong enough to be able to defeat imperial challenges. Um, and uh, the local level, which is always in, in danger of being, um, you know, homogenized by too strong a center, I don't think there's any way to solve that problem. But um, but when we, we we look at polities that are uh, successful, they 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 very often have that kind of structure. It's 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 not just you know the United States or Australia or, or, or federal Germany, I mean, even, even Britain that we don't usually think of as a federation is constructed so that, uh, yes, there's one king and there's one parliament in Westminster, but the Scottish, Scottish church was, you know, never the Church of England, and, uh, and, and the Church of Ireland is also something different, so that um, I think that this, uh, this model of allowing um, d d different levels to 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 uh, maintain degrees of independence. Uh, I think that this is a necessity for a successful nationalism, for good nationalism, not just in America but in general. Now, Yoram, before I turn this over to Charles, let me ask you: um, In America today, is such a thing as a national conservatism viable? Are the American people conservative enough at the national level? for that to be viable, or uh, as many people have started to say, do you need a more localized kind of conservatism that might be able to survive, even if it means that uh, the country as a whole is not as conservative as one would like? I think that's the only reasonable way to look at it. I mean, I, th this is a, you know, as, as Charles said last night, that uh, the, um, the Dobbs decision uh, 
opened up this vista for a moment where all sorts of people started saying, oh, let, you know, let's, let, let's impo impose a conservative view of abortion on, on, on the 50 states. I, I think this is not realistic. I mean, you know, we, we, we can argue in theory about what's desirable, but in, in, in practice, we have one mission right now. And that mission is to show that it's possible to establish conservative countries or states on any scale, you know, that are not going to be, you know, the Ayatollah, the, the, the Iranian Ayatollah regime, because that, I mean, that's what everybody's saying about us. They're saying, you know, there's no possibility that, that you know, that, that, uh, that uh, different kinds of conservatives could have a regime that would, you know, would be anything other than fascistic. That's the goal right now. The goal is to, is to someplace, you know, whether, whether it's in Florida or in Texas or in Hungary or, or, or in Britain, someplace to show that a dramatically more conservative uh, kind of regime is possible and that most people would actually not find it anywhere near as appalling as they seem to think they would. So Charles, uh, yesterday you brought up the example of Abraham Lincoln and his view of slavery that Lincoln was in the long run an abolitionist, but he understood uh, the role of the states within the system. He was not trying to you know, immediately f compel uh, southern states to uh, end slavery. And you, know, you brought this up in the context of Dobbs and, and Roe and abortion policy. So how do you look at the dilemma facing conservatives now where they have an absolute principle, the pro-life principle, but they also are facing, perhaps uh, in many states certainly, uh, a public which is not uh, on board with their views. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, it's good to be here uh, and with my friend Yoram. Um, I think that uh, obviously this is a task of persuasion. Um, and for that reason, I guess you could say I'm, on, uh, I'm in favor of a kind of Lincolnian analogy in our policy. Uh, and uh, that means that Florida can have a different abortion law um, than Iowa or California might want to have, uh, but that um, those laws will be deliberated democratically in the states. But the, 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 let me go back to the federalism question since you raised it, because I think this is, it's an interesting issue because it raises the question uh, of the activity of the, f of, of the founders themselves as founders. That is not people who turn to books to figure out what, kind, what form of government is suitable for their people. I mean, there is, a, there is, of course, a Lockean component to the founding in which we had, a, and that was a very lovely panel, I thought, uh, and, uh, be, that preceded us. It was really quite enjoyable and, and smart and uh, well done. Um, but uh, there's also a kind of Montesquieuian part of the American founding in which, you know, you have to, you tailor the garment to fit the person who's going to wear it. And so you have to have a form of government that fits the people and that they, that they will accept uh, and uh, support. But federalism is one of those inventions, really, of the founding fathers. I mean, it comes out of the deliberative process in the convention, in the Philadelphia Convention. No one came into <clears throat> uh, Philadelphia with a, with, a, with a theory of federalism that was... Um, um, enacted there. There were ups and downs. Uh, there, you know, there was a small state version of the Constitution at one point uh, with uh, sort of more equality in the legislature. There was a, <clears throat> then there was a, a large state version and then there was finally the compromise version. Um, but that raises in turn the general problem that <clears throat> were the founders prisoners of, the, of their ideas, of the ideas of the age that they had, that they existed in. Were they prisoners of 18th century political categories? Or were they free to reflect on the advantages and disadvantages of Lockean categories and Montesquieuian categories and other categories and f choose what they felt most suitable for their people in their situation? That seems to me to be 
to raise the question whether practical reason in the, in the old-fashioned sort of Aristotelian sense, <clears throat> deciding what is best to do here and now, um, was, it was possible or not. Uh, if you don't have that, then you're sort of a prisoner of um, theoretical categories in something like the fashion that Yoram is objecting to. I think that to the extent we take the founders seriously, we open the possibility of them deliberating about Lockean ideas and adopting w which parts of Locke they find illuminating or useful in their situation and rejecting other parts um, in the name of practical wisdom, of what's going to work, what's good uh, for our community and what will make it a stronger and better um, community down the line. So uh, I was very interested in what Yoram said about the, the 1930s influence on Locke scholarship. I thought that was a very perceptive uh, observation because when, when Locke and Lockean liberalism are discovered as categories, they are discovered by, or not just discovered, but you know, promulgated by people like Louis Hartz in the, his famous book on the liberal tradition um, in America. Uh, as precisely as 18th century ideas. I mean, his theory was essentially America began as a part of British political culture that sort of broke off and floated across the Atlantic in the 17th century. And we were stuck with 17th century British ideas ever since. And his interpretation of America is that we are, we're, we're, a kind, we're in a kind of iron cage of 17th century liberalism. And unlike the lucky Europeans <laughs> who went on to uh, experience, you know, Rousseau and Marx and, <clears throat> to, and Nietzsche and to progress <laughs> ideologically uh, into the horrors of 20th century uh, totalitarianism, we were frozen. And that was in some ways an advantage and in some ways um, a very unhappy uh, uh, prison that we are in. And he doesn't, I mean, he, he's all about Locke, but he doesn't like Locke. I mean, he thinks Locke is bourgeois liberalism, basically not radical enough for a person of his tastes um, or for the 20th century, really. And I think that's uh, this question of how, do, how much freedom did the founders have really goes to this side of it as well. Um, you know, w were we... Um, is the only way to understand Locke uh, as, a, as himself a product of the 17th century. Um, and, you know, he is confined to his, uh, he's a children of his age, and we've been children of his, we're children of his, we are his children of that age, still stuck in the 17th century. Or is it really possible to inquire after truth in a timeless way, whether as a, as a philosopher or as a, um, in the necessarily more limited way of a political actor uh, in his times. So that's uh, some thoughts which th the conversation before us really um, brought to mind. So I'll ask a rather uh, radical question that I think brings together both the philosophy and the practical question. Uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has uh, lately been criticized for using the phrase national divorce, which uh, seems to imply something rather stronger than federalism. And uh, at the last uh, Philadelphia Society meeting uh, in Virginia, uh, the great Michael Anton gave some remarks that uh, uh, were the, the cause of much controversy among uh, the East Coast Straussians, the people who are, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, uh, very much aligned at this point, I guess, with uh, the Democratic Party and Joe Biden. But uh, Michael Anton had said, you know, there, our founding fathers believed in a right to revolution, and there was a certain point at which a political order has to be uh, toppled. Um, now, many panicky progressives uh, see the term national divorce, they hear talk of the founding fathers and revolution, and they, they imagine a civil war. Um, now, when does a, a alarm get tripped? When are we approaching a moment where uh, the sort of ideological intensity of conflicts within this country and the you know, sort of uh, oppressiveness 
of a state which defines itself as liberal but may in fact be profoundly illiberal. Um, what, what, what does the right of revolution, what does the concept of national divorce really mean? When, is this a, you know, a sort of canary in the coal mine or do we really need to think about you know, when we reach a point where at least philosophically we have to completely reject the regime that, that currently exists? Um, so let me point that to uh, Yoram first perhaps. Okay, the, these are great and difficult questions. I, I, um, I think the place to start, uh, the, the place I'd like to start is we're not good at seeing what's coming. This is, this is a, it, it's a fundamental bedrock fact about human cognition that um, we're, we're real good at looking at, you know, looking at, at the past and interpreting it and we're terrible at predicting. I mean, just, you know, almost no one saw the collapse of the Soviet Union coming. You know, maybe there were two guys out of 10,000 people paid full-time salaries to see the collapse of the Soviet Union coming. And you can say the same thing about the, uh, the, the, the housing mar market bubble collapse in 2008 and, and, and to the, the, you know, Brexit and Trump were things that you know, almost no one saw coming. You could just keep going. We're terrible. We're terrible about knowing what's going to happen next. And so I, um, so I, I don't want to begin with any kind of assertion about where it's going. I think, I mean, I, I, I think we all kind of see the same thing as far as where it's going. Uh, it looks really bad, but that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. It could be that something else is going to happen. So having created that big caveat, because we don't know what's going to happen, I think we need to uh, come up with the most plausible um, set of moves that could lead to an improvement in, 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 in our situation. And, and I, I'm, I'm not the kind of Burke reader who thinks that every improvement needs to be slow. He, you know, when, when, when Poland was on, the, on, on the, the verge of collapse, Burke was willing to have a, a a rapid, radical uh, adjustment of the Polish constitution as long as it looked more like the British one. So I, I don't rule out um, a dr dramatic action, but like Charles, I think that um, we don't have the proof that, that America's done for. What we have is a an extraordinarily um, uh, bitter division which appears to be getting worse and worse and crazier and crazier. We, I, I, I think that we, that we do have. Um, could it turn violent? Of course it could. Um, I don't think there's any advantage to trying. I mean, I, I, I read Michael's um, essay, the essay version. Is that him over there? <laughs> he's, he, he's, he's working on the next one. So That's so, Michael Anton. Right. I don't know if it's the great Michael Anton or not. Though, <laughs> So I, look, so I, 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 I read his essay, and of course, you know, I, um, the, the, uh, the feeling that you know, there, there would be tremendous relief if, uh, if you could part ways and have two different countries. I mean, you know, I, I, I feel that as well. But because we're not good at knowing what happens next, I, I, I'm also very sharply aware that creating uh, two Americas that hate each other um, is uh, one very, very likely outcome of this is, you know, is, is, is 100 or 200 years of, of warfare between these two Americas. So I, I feel the power of the attraction. I don't think that we know, an, that, that we can actually say, yes, let's do that because we know that's the better course. At the moment, what we've got to do is we've got to take up the, uh, the first steps that, that, that we've seen uh, from certain governors in you know, certain European countries where we're watching um, carefully calibrated attempts to restore um, earlier, earlier versions of, uh, of conservatism, traditionalism, um, uh, democracy that is not you know, tied to uh, radical enlightenment liberalism like, like to an anchor. Um, and um, let's, my proposal is let's do everything we can to 
create some conservative states, some conservative, you know, small European countries that people can admire. And maybe that will just do all sorts of things that we, we can't imagine. Charles, would uh, you agree with uh, Yoram on that? Well, yes, I think I, I think I do. I mean, the problem with the with a divorce is that there is no divorce law, and there is no court uh, in which you could have some sort of neutral arbitration of the divorce claims. So we're talking about the parties themselves coming to a uh, a decision about who gets what um, and what the nature of the relationship is going to be, and that is. V that, I think, is extremely uh, hard to imagine happening. Um, for one thing, the blue states, the deep blue states, are scattered uh, along both coasts um, and don't, are not contiguous with each other. Uh, they're separated by a lot of red states and red counties. Um, in some ways, it's a city and country problem rather than a... Um, uh, a state problem. There are problems within states as well. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's likely to be extremely, extremely messy. And for that reason, I think uh, it's prudent to uh, wait and see. And see, see if, um, <clears throat> as Yoram says, um, the example of red states won't, in the long, being successful uh, and free, and, and virtuous, to some extent at least, won't have some influence on the populations of the blue states. Uh, that's not impossible, uh, also difficult to imagine. I mean, we are, this is almost at the level of a kind of religious civil war uh, or cold religious civil war. Very hard to um, compromise, very hard even to reason with our fellow citizens. <clears throat> but not impossible, at least not yet. So I'm curious to see what uh, philosophical differences we might bring out by reflecting on this same question historically. So I'd be curious to ask each of you, what justified the American Revolution? Yoram? Hmm. Um, good question. Wow, you've got a lot of good questions. Uh, I, I Look, um, let me begin way back. Uh, overthrowing tyranny is uh, is biblical. Uh, it's 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 cornerstone of Western civilization, going you know back to to our oldest scriptures, and um, so <laughs> the question, of course, is you know what actually constitutes tyranny? If you're you know if it. it I think that if you're a reasonable person, then you, you would say, you know, with Aristotle, you would say, look, it's just almost always such a disaster to overthrow the laws that in general you just want to keep, you just want to keep the laws, that's safer. And both of those, both of those things are true. Um, look, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for, for the, um, at least the more moderate wing of the, the American revolutionaries. Uh, my sympathy is because I understand um, they had lived for 150 years under a certain constitution in, a, in America. Um, and that constitution had a role for the king and it had a role for, for, the, uh, for the, the, the local legislatures and, 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 and governors. And, uh, they believed that to uh, that the moment that Parliament began taxing, instead of the uh, American colonial government's taxing, they saw that as a revolution. They saw that as a as the the destruction of the existing constitution. Um, so I think the argument makes sense. I'm not so sure that I personally would have run to pick up a musket because of that. But, you know, uh, the, proof, proof, the proof of the pudding is, uh, is you know, it, it, it's there before us. It seems it worked out pretty well in the end. Uh, 
I'll note that uh, Yoram started a publication at Princeton University called the Princeton Tory. So you've just had a good expression of an American Tory uh, view of the revolution. Uh, Charles, what's your view? Well, I, I mean, uh, you could say that in a way the short answer is no, no taxation without representation. Um, it was um, more particularly in the declaration, the problem is the accusation that the, that the king is no longer a king but is a tyrant and that um, he's not fit to be the ruler of a free people. I mean, that's really, it's, it's, it is, like all these things, ultimately an argument about who America is or what America is. It's a free people. Um, and it won't, it's too, uh, it's, it's, love of freedom is not merely abstract, it's also spirited. And they won't take it any longer. I mean, at some point, that is something like the argument uh, of the Declaration of Independence. But it's, you know, it is, uh, it, it's an argument that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, you might say the, the right wing of the revolution and the left wing of the revolution, and to sort of use um, Yoram's terms, at least provisionally, united. I mean, they're on the committee. They write the declaration. Uh, you know, Jefferson does the first draft, uh, but they edit it. Um, and uh, it represents a joint... Um, judgment of the uh, uh, of the Continental Congress at that point, and in the Continental Congress there is a debate about at some point before the writing of the Declaration of Independence, in which Adams participates, in which the question is raised: Should we keep the argument at the level of the charters, the colonial charters, and the British Constitution, or should we turn to the Book of Nature? Should we look? Should we open? the natural rights and natural law argument. And there is a discussion, there's a deliberation, and there may even have been a vote, I'm not sure about that, but the decision essentially was made, Adams pushing the issue, let us make the argument on the broadest possible basis, uh, and that means on the basis of nature and the claim of natural rights, not just charter rights. But the turn to natural, the natural rights argument uh, was preceded by a decade of argumentation, not only about nature, but also and very intricately about the British Constitution. And so that was not the, you might say, the first resort or the immediate resort. It was the last resort that the, that the founders, uh, who would become founders, turned to. Uh, that's important to bear in mind, I think, on the question of their prudence. Um, they were quite happy to be members of the British Empire. I mean, they just fought... Uh, alongside uh, the British in a tremendous world war, seven, you know, the, uh, the Seven Years' War, um, and uh, they defeated the French, the British defeated the French overwhelmingly. So it was a proud time to be a loyal British subject. Um, but as so often happens, the real problems begin when you get what you want. And so with that victory comes a whole series of problems which leads to a very gradual estrangement between the two sides and the thought of divorce so to speak becomes more and more thinkable uh, in the course of those in the course of those years and the basic objection was that the english constitution meant something different over there than it did over here the king had not used his veto power in england since the time of queen anne uh, over here he used it regularly against colonial legislation um, you know, Britain had uh, represent, uh, all the commoners in Britain were represented in Parliament. We did not have representatives in Parliament, and yet we're being taxed b by that foreign um, legislature. So, in, in a way, the failure of the British Constitution makes it necessary to appeal to nature uh, as a way of um, uh, saving their position in America. So in the American Revolution, we had, on the one hand, the rights of Englishmen, uh, which were very dear to the colonists as rights that they actually historically enjoyed. We also had the natural rights tradition, whose uh, uh, involvement in the revolution you've just described. Today, of course, uh, the language of rights is often used by progressives, liberals, and persons on the left uh, in order to advance identity politics and to advance uh, a quite revolutionary transformation of uh, the American order in a way that, um, you know, based on the discussion in the last panel, perhaps even John Locke would be shocked and, and appalled by. 
Um, so how should American conservatives think about the concept of rights in the 21st century? Does the fact that this language is now used by the left to such a pervasive degree mean that we should now eschew discussion of rights, or do we have to try to reclaim rights from the left? Well, look, the, there's political tactics, and then there's you know the, the, the great philosophical question kind of thing. Um, look, I, I, I was um, um, one of one of the best speeches in NatCon uh, in in Miami was um, a speech by a uh, a, a um, young Protestant uh, pastor's wife named uh, Katie Faust, and she. Um, made it an astonishingly eloquent, persuasive, dramatic case um, that we have to talk more about children's rights. And she, she begins with you know, asking what is good for children and proceeds to make the argument that really we should be saying a child has a right to his or her biological parents and that all adults you know, regardless of uh, uh, married, divorced, gay, straight, a, a fertile, infertile, all adults need to uh, be you know, made to organize their lives in order to give the child uh, his or her rights, which is you know, to be raised as close as possible to the, the biological and mother and father. Now, it's much more eloquent than what I just said, and it, it, it's extremely effective. I've been sending it to Orthodox rabbis all over America and Israel, and it, it's very powerful. Now, look, um, on the one hand, I um, um, look. The, the, this is this is a, a bitter pu public debate, and if you've got an argument that can work, then then you you probably ought to use it. But um, uh, but but I have to say that. Uh, our, our society is sick, and part of a very large part of the sickness is the constant manufacturing of new rights. Uh, with, without any, any real, I mean, uh, Charles maybe will, will, you know, will come up with a, a way of addressing this problem, but to me the problem looks like um, that uh, what, not that there's no such thing as, as, uh, uh, as natural human rights, but that it's, there, there's very few of them, it's difficult to find them, it's difficult to get agreement about them, and, and what seems to have happened is that you know, the, the plausible human rights that I, I think Charles and I would probably agree on many of them, um, opened a door which has turned into just, you know, you know FDR just, you know, Manufactured like another twenty rights, and the 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 the, the declaration of the rights of uh, man and the citizen. I don't I don't know how many are there in the UN. Everybody's generating rights, and it look it's all at a certain level it's all it's all nonsense. I mean, every single right that's being proposed there there is some element of of truth to it. But what's missing is that a that a traditional political order um, is constantly balancing things. And rebalancing them, and then you know things things tilt in one direction, they go too far, and then they get rebalanced back. That's what a healthy conservative political order does. And one of the ways that you can describe the balance among the different considerations is is using the term rights. But as soon as they're universal, and anybody can declare them, uh, it 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 seems like they are, you know, they're the French Revolution. They they they, they look like they're just destroying our world. So I. I, I told Katie, you know, I'm, I, 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 I think it's a, a great cause, I'll help you, but I'm really hesitant to, to manufacture yet more rights. Well, look, if, if um, people say there is a, uh, a right to abortion um, uh, at the convenience of the mother, um, don't you have to say at some point that the child has rights to? Um, it, you know, it's, uh, there, the, there's, the distinction is, it seems to me, not rights or no rights. It's good rights, real rights, versus phony ones. And um, plus there is the fact that America, I mean, um, the American tradition um, is rights, or at least it includes 
discussions of rights as a central feature uh, of, of the political tradition. So even from, from Burkean reasons alone, you know, Burke in America would talk more about rights than he did in England, let's say. Um, he has to, this is our tradition in a way. And partly that's because we had, I mean, our nation had slavery. I mean, it was in a very unusual position uh, in which uh, it had, uh, as an organic part of its political institutions, a radical form of chattel slavery. Um, and th this is another, uh, you know, good question about the, the prudence of the founders. And they had to deal with this issue. And they didn't deal with it to everyone's uh, satisfaction. But it seems to me that um, if you've got um, a country which already has a big difference between northern and southern states uh, at the point at which you're trying to turn this into a, some kind of a nation, the, the first question is, is this one nation or is this 13 nations that are agreeing in an alliance or a treaty? Uh, a baker's dozen of sovereignties, as Wilmore Kendall famously put it, uh, that's the first question. The second question is, how do you, you know, then there's the large states, small states, and then third, there is the, uh, the question of slavery and states that uh, don't have slavery, or many of them recently had slavery, but we're already beginning to um, look to the abolition of slavery in their states. So, uh, because slavery was such a moral um, cancer in America, you had to deal with it. Uh, you, but you couldn't, uh, you couldn't cut it out um, without risking the life of the patient. You had to treat it uh, and wait for a moment when it could be successfully uh, terminated. But even then, uh, you know, the, the difficulties of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan were in a way previewed in the in Reconstruction. I mean, it's very difficult to impose democracy in the name of de your version of democracy, which I'm not saying is not a better version of democracy than the southern one had been, um, on states that, though defeated on the battlefield, had not accepted basically the premise of the victors. Um, we didn't do well at Reconstruction. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it came back to haunt us in the 20th century in many ways. We're still involved in sort of figuring out um, how much you can impose a policy on a population that is resistant or even dead set against it. Uh, and uh, from a certain point of view, the, the questions of political correctness and abortion law and all these things are analogy, anal analogies um, to that, the racial problem that we had as a nation from the very beginning. If you don't have slavery, you have less need for a discussion of rights. And, uh, but America had slavery. It was a big part, still is a part, in a way, of our... Um, nation, and it's, it's so uh, as much as we deplore um, progressive rights, um, I think the uh, American way of dealing with that is by a renewal of genuine rights and rights discourse, if you want to call it that. Well, in rights discourse uh, from John Locke and Thomas Jefferson through to today, is very closely connected to this idea of the role of philosophy and reason within politics, that uh, Locke and Jefferson certainly thought they were using the powers of reason to understand human nature and what rights were appropriate uh, to it. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, today's uh, progressives and leftists will at least claim that they are using uh, their form of reason and their scholarship to derive uh, new rights. Now, I know Yoram is very skeptical of the use of reason in politics in this way, but uh, I'll have a slightly different version of this question for each of you. But for Yoram, um, is it avoidable? Uh, you, you would prefer an empiricist and a, uh, a politics that relies on revelation rather than on this attempt to derive principles from natural reason. But isn't there something in man as a rational animal, 
which is the Aristotelian idea, of course, which is constantly drawing us back to the application of reason to politics. And if this is unavoidable, then do you have to, you know, sort of modify uh, or, you know, even check your own natural resistance to this uh, impulse to use reason in politics? Uh, you know, I, I, I think that, although it's a little bit rude, I think I'm going to read you a few lines from, from my new book, because I, look, let me just say about rights, the, the, the rights talk is English. The, 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 the common lawyers are talking about rights all the time. The, the, uh, the, the American Bill of Rights is uh, largely constructed on the, uh, on the English Petition of Right and on, on the English Bill of Rights. And, and, and these things are constructs of the common lawyers. And so from my perspective, what, 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 what the Americans are doing when they, um, when, when they push English rights talk in the direction of this right applies in Iraq too, is, is they're, they're taking something that has a tremendous amount of evidence that it works and transplanting it not just to, you know, to a, uh, a, a new locale where a great many British, you know, uh, uh, Englishmen and, and Scots and, and, and Dutch and other people who are, who are familiar with this kind of rights discourse, they're, they're, they're not just extending it, they're, um, extending it ad infinitum. They're saying these rights apply everywhere in all times and places. That, that's what I'm suspicious of. It's not that there's something wrong with rights talk. Rights talk is a, it's a, a venerable and su successful way that the, that, that the English and other European countries developed for describing the balances among different competing interests and, pr and principles. And, and I, I don't have any problem with uh, Americans doing that. He, Here's the problem, the big problem. The big problem is that, um, and I, I think this is really where, where, where Charles and I are going to find, find something nice to disagree about. I, I, I think that, there it is, uh, that the description of human beings as rational animals is wildly um, exaggerated and also underdetermined. It's not clear what, you know, what reason we're talking about. Because, you know, the, the, there's the kind of reason that the Cartesians use where, you know, you begin with self-evident, clear and present, not clear, clear, clear and distinct ideas, thank you, <coughs> ideas which are, you know, you just think about them and they get, they get so clear that you can then do infallible deductions from them and then you've just answered universal questions about the entire universe. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm making it sound silly, but that's just because it, it really is. It's, it, it, I mean, it's just, it's a terrible description of human reason. Um, I, I also think, by the way, that, that you know, some of the big reason promoters today, Steven Pinker, I don't think he's, you know, I, 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 I like him, he's a good heart. I don't think he's thought very much. And it's funny, he writes all these books about reason, but I just don't think he's thought very much about the different possibilities for how human cognition works and what reason would be. Okay, so when we get to Aristotle, we're definitely getting to something that is closer to something that I consider to be reasonable. But, 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 I, but I do, I have, I have all sorts of problems with it. I, I think, for example, that just, 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 just to, I'll try to make this short, but I, I think an example would be helpful. Um, Aristotle places um, human sociability, human socialness within the category of aspects of human reason. So when, when he's talking about human being as a rational animal, part of what he's talking about is, is we, we reason about whether it would be good for us to live in society together, and then we're in society together. We, we find the same kind of argument also in Plato and obviously in, in the Enlightenment. The problem is, I think that this is factually wrong. Like, I think he just got it wrong. I think that there are a great many species of higher and lower animals that live in hierarchically ordered um, societies that are very, very, very similar to, to human society. The, 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 th the things that you're, you know, your alpha wolf or your alpha horse or your alpha, you know, Jordan Peterson wrote about alpha lobsters. I mean, the, 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 things, the things that we do to one another in order to 
seek status are very, I mean, they're, they're, you know, when somebody's insulting you on Twitter, what all he's doing is he's like, he's like, you know, one of these, these, you know, lobsters banging his big claw on you, trying to get you to be lower down in the status so that he can have a better, it, 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 it's amazing how much of what we are is uh, human um, um, natural ends, such as um, uh, uh, be, being loyal to one another, which creates a society, or um, competing with one another for status, which gains us influence. It gains us the ability, to, uh, the, the more status we have, the more people are, are willing to take our ideas seriously. So, you know, we'd like to say that, well, reason is about, you know, me being really persuasive and you being less persuasive, and so, you know, I win. But, the, but we know it's not really like that, what, a lot of the time what's happening is, is that, you know, the, the, the guy who has the nicer smile or uh, cracks the better joke or, 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 you know, just rolls out like 15 things that he mem memorized and just, you know, convinces everybody that he's, he's the alpha lobster and, and, and that argument wins. And so what I'm saying is that, um, that the Aristotelian tradition which assumes, which, which we then inherit in various modern forms, which assumes that reason is good enough to be able to, you know, to, to be the heart of what a human being is, to describe what we're, what we're doing when we're doing it well, I think it's all false. Now that's, that's not because I don't like reason. I love reason, <laughs> but, but it's just, it's, its range is so much smaller than, than the Aristotelians and the, the, the liberals think it is. Now, I want to be careful in uh, not ascribing this view to Euron necessarily, but several of the points you brought up about lobsters, hierarchy, natural hierarchy, etc. this is a, uh, a way of thinking that one often finds among conservatives and others who are influenced by Darwinianism. And they say the natural biological world provides us with uh, these clues as to the operation of human society. Uh, Charles, I guess my question for you is, what is the role of right reason in politics? And, uh, you know, does this uh, older Aristotelian tradition, which was certainly very important to Leo Strauss, uh, can it be recovered, or is it in fact something that has been surpassed by this, you know, uh, more modern, biological, perhaps Darwinian understanding of, you know, human nature? Well, the gloves are really coming off now. Um, <clears throat> So, we, uh, so now we know that uh, Yoram's objections to Enlightenment reason really are objections to reason, at least in the Aristotelian tradition of reason, uh, as you call it. So um, that's, uh, you know, so that's profound. I mean, and, and it raises questions about the medieval clerics you point to also as sources, Fortescue and others, uh, as uh, sources of wisdom about politics, uh, because mostly they are Aristotelians too, and they would accept his definition of man as a rational animal. And that's a, that's a, that's a category. I mean, that's a truth that you grasp, um, and that in grasping it, you prove it. I mean, that you, you recognize um, that uh, you are a different kind of animal from dogs and cats, uh, uh, or a different kind of being from trees, um, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and that is a kind of self-evident um, apprehension, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in the language of the schools. Um, if, you, if you can't know that, if you can't know that you're not a dog, um, then th that, <laughs> that suggests a, a certain um, terrible incomprehension of reality, empirical reality. The difference between a man and a dog is visible, observable, empirical. It's not abstract, although there is an abstract element in it. There's a universal that makes this dog kin of another dog or, and many other kinds of dog species and makes humans uh, completely different from all those species. So that reason which, can, which combines particulars and universals in its apprehensions, that is 
natural reason, I think. I mean, that's what Aristotle and Plato are talking about in different ways, um, and which, uh, uh, you know, uh, Richard Weaver was talking about in his own account of uh, conservatism and the problem of nominalism and so forth. Um, and it just seems to me that you can't, um, you can't really talk about the difference between empirical uh, and deductive methods if you can't start from an apprehension of things which is both empirical and theoretical, if you want to say, um, at the same time or universal at the same time. That's common sense. I mean, common sense is that combination of particulars and universals that lets you immediately see the difference between a dachshund and a firefighter uh, and to understand that they have different tasks you know, they have different ends, different work, characteristic work that they are uh, and can, uh, intend to perform. Uh, so it, it, at some point, I think the, um, the objection to reason uh, is unreasonable uh, because, because, you know, the, you, what faculty are you using to object to reason? It's reason. Uh, in some sense, uh, and there's a sort of uh, uh, circularity to that <coughs> position, which I think uh, is is self undermining. So, um, when the founders looked at their position, um, they were using reason. They were using practical reason, which was fully conversant with the empirical facts of of their their time, the laws of England the regulations of England, the decisions of Parliament and the King, all of that they took into account in deciding what was the best thing to do under the circumstances. As I said, that's practical reason. Um, what you're objecting to, I think, is uh, theoretical reason um, applied to practice. I mean, what you're saying is you, you can't go from universals to particular courses of action. Um, and, and as far as that goes, that's true. You have to, you, you, the operation of prudence is to combine universals with intimate knowledge of the particulars of action. So I'm not sure whether you're in fact disagreeing with Aristotle or in a way maybe objecting to the, his terminology, but I think you're really getting, trying to get to the same place that he describes. The question is, is this a prudent thing to do or not under the circumstances? And that means, does it match universals to particulars correctly or does it mismatch them? And in the case of the French Revolution, which is a colossal mismatch, we all agree on that, um, it's also true that the, their version of the natural rights argument is very different from the American version of it. I mean, if you look at their Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, um, it mentions, well, it, it's, it is, there are many differences immediately observable, but one of them is um, there is no, there's, the general will is mentioned. I mean, so it's in the French one. It's a, it's a more, much more Rousseauian account um, than a Lockean account, if you want to call it that. The, the big difference being, from Rousseau's point of view, you have to give up your natural rights and all of your advantages when you join civil society. You, you alienate them to um, civil society, which then decides via the general will who gets what and how the government uh, is going to operate on particular policies and so forth. <clears throat> In America, you keep your rights, your, your natural rights, or at least you keep most of your natural rights uh, when you enter civil society. And therefore, you always have the possibility of objecting to civil society because it is violating your rights, violating the contract you made when you joined civil society. Um, in, uh, and, and the differences, I mean, part of the, to come back to where we started, part of the, of the 20th century misreading of all of these philosophers is to homogenize them by their age. 
And so the 18th century French Revolution and the 18th century American Revolution must be deeply kin because they are children of the same ideas. The same spirit of the age must be present in each of them. But that's Hegel, um, or worse. That's, that's not, uh, it seems to me, a, um, uh, a, a sensitive and rational reading of the actual sources and their arguments. So we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers, but as you think of questions, uh, Yoram has something he'd like to read. I, I, I should have done, I just should have done this earlier. Part, part of the problem is I, I spent a couple of years trying to figure out, okay, so you're criticizing the liberals' <clears throat> premises. What are your premises? And conservatives don't usually like to admit that they have premises. <clears throat> um, there's, there's good reasons for that, but basically it, it makes a big mess. So I actually wrote down some premises, and, uh, and I, I think that after I read this, Charles can tell me how far or how close I am to, to being a good Aristotelian. So um, <clears throat> premise number one, you, men are born into families, tribes, and nations to which they're bound by ties of mutual loyalty. Number two, individuals, families, tribes, and nations compete for honor, importance, and influence until the threat of common, the, <clears throat> the, 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 until a threat or common endeavor recalls them to the mutual loyalty uh, that bind them together. So this is, this is something that's familiar from both from sociology and also from, from, from animals, that we, uh, we, we tend to be in groups, we like to be in groups, and then we compete with other groups until we're threatened from the outside, and then those groups have a possibility of coming together. Families, and, families tribes, and nations are hierarchic, hierarchically structured, their members having importance and influence to the degree that they are honored within the hierarchy. Okay, and now we get to the, uh, the, the higher, more civilized parts of all, all of this. Number four, language, religion, law, and the forms of government and economic activity, this would certainly include rights, <clears throat> are traditional institutions developed by families, tribes, and nations as they seek to strengthen their own mater material material prosperity, internal integrity, and cultural inheritance, and to propagate themselves through time. Five, political obligation as a consequence of mem membership in tr families, tribes, and nations. Where does reason appear? In this book, and I, I, I write at some length about what I think reason, human reason is. It's certainly not the reason of a dog. It's certainly something special. But the reason that I'm describing is something that operates in groups. These, these hierarchical groupings, families, tribes, nations, also <clears throat> academic disciplines, for example, professions, they hand down a set of ideas and the principles that uh, interlock, uh, that, that, that hold the principles together. And then the, the individual's reason is, you know, those of you who read Thomas Kuhn, this will sound extremely familiar. Individual reason, there's two parts to it. There's the, there's the part where you're just sort of taking inherit, inherited ideas and applying them, which is what most people are doing most of the time. And then there are, you know, the more creative people who are, who, they're more creative, they have more guts, they're, 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 they're less afraid, they're more upset about injustice or something. And they start to tug and twist at the inherited structure to repair it and improve it. So I call this constructive reason because it begins with a tradition and then seeks to fix the tradition. I think that that is what the common lawyers and also, by the way, the, the, the rabbis, both the common lawyers and the rabbis, when they talk about reason, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the fixing and improving of an inherited tradition to make it more just, more beneficial, more internally coherent. So before we go to audience questions, let me just ask Charles quite quickly, does that strike you as uh, Aristotelian, roughly speaking, or is it historicist? Um, well, it's, uh, uh, it's in the neighborhood of Aristotle. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, the, um, it, I would say the, the problem with it, I mean, we could talk a lot about 
about its strengths and weaknesses, but um, you, you, men are born in families. Human, that is to say, human beings are born in families. So there's a difference between humans and non-human animals, let's say. What is that difference? Um, they both have different kinds of family structures, different kinds of activities characteristic of them, and so forth. Um, but uh, human beings are the only ones who um, argue about their institutions. Uh, bees are always found in monarchies. They live in hives ruled by queens. <clears throat> um, human beings can choose uh, or find themselves in regimes ruled by queens, but they may also decide to overthrow their queens. Worker bees of the world never unite to overthrow their queens. Um, for them, instinct, it's hardwired, you know, their politics is hardwired. And Aristotle says man is more political than any of the other political animals, like bees uh, and ants, um, because we have speech and we don't, we don't, our forms of government are not natural to us. We have to arrive at them. We have to argue about them. We have to use conventions and laws to create them. You know, so the, um, let me sp speak um, technically for a moment. The, the, you know, the teleology of, a, of an acorn is simple. It becomes an oak tree, no question about that. Uh, it achieves its ends by nature. But human beings have, two, have different ends. We have, you know, the, the end of the city or, or politics is both mere life and the good life. And how you put mere life, you know, including self-defense and national security and all those kinds of things, uh, and personal security, how you put that together with the good life is not determined by instinct. It's up to us to think about that and figure it out. And out of the different possibilities come many different kinds of human political orders. Um, and that indetermination um, is natural to us. It's natural to us to create conventions to rule ourselves. So, I mean, Aristotle is, um, certainly doesn't believe that politics is all about reason or, you know, is reason from top to bottom. No, it involves necessarily conventions and passions and uh, humors and habits and virtues and all of these things which um, accompany reason. So, um, I mean, the nakedness of reason is, I think, in a way, um, what's, to me at least, would be wrong with your view. I mean, from, from Plato and Aristotle's point of view, reason um, is, one of reason's function is to order the passions and the likes and dislikes and the habits of people. And when it's done well, there's a kind of harmony between reason and our emotional reactions to things. If you know uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, you know, the abolition of man <clears throat> is men without natural law, <laughs> essentially. That is, human beings who don't think there's any connection between um, their emotional reactions or even artistic reactions to things outside of them and some kind of intrinsic standard um, of right and wrong or good and bad. Um, but the, the well-adjusted uh, Aristotelian or Platonist, as far as that goes, would be the one who has the right emotional reaction. When he sees um, a crime happen, he should be indignant at that and, and wants to see the criminal punished. And that's not social conditioning. That's a proper relationship between empirical reality and the universal uh, the violation of a universal principle of you know, bodily integrity or property rights or whatever, you, you'd, however you might describe it. So I think it's, uh, the tradition is richer um, maybe than you, you give it credit for.
So we only have about 10 minutes. Uh, let's go ahead and take a few questions, and please do frame them in the form of a question uh, as opposed to an argument. So, and we have a microphone uh, in the back there from uh, Sasha. So, yes, sir. So, so I've been wondering about this all day, and I keep hearing you talk about the left as, as working within a reasoning framework. But the reasoning framework, I mean, the appropriate framework says we're going to start out with a specific set of axioms and derive things from those axioms. What I see on the left is that it's a completely non-axiomatic system. So we'll come up with something new we want to conclude, like universal health care, and then say, oh, wait, did we not used to have an axiom that said that health care was a human right? Okay, so we'll introduce this new axiom that says healthcare is a human right, and from that we can, defri we can derive that we need universal healthcare, but of course we'll carve out an exception if you choose not to get a COVID vaccination, in which case we should deny you healthcare, which doesn't make you subhuman, because the axiom was really that it's a human right for people who get the vaccines they're supposed to. So, so I, I mean, how, how do you, I mean, is this really a reasoning system, or is this completely non-axiomatic? Uh, it, 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 look, there's uh, um, there's bad reasoners in every group, but uh, my 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 experience with uh, with academic Marxists is that some of them are very very fine reasoners. They but it's just their their axioms are they begin like I do. They say, look, you, human beings are, are are clumpy and they form into groups, and then they proceed to the next axiom is. The stronger group always oppresses the weaker group, and the next axiom of after that is, since that's inevitable, um, the only way out is is through revolution and the destruction of the society. Look, that that's, I, I think Charles would say that's bad reasoning. I, I I think it's perfectly fine reasoning. It just happens to be something that's going to destroy all of us. Yeah. Well, I mean, the left has a tradition of social Darwinism. Uh, even though um, you know, they managed to pin the label of social Darwinism on the right, all of its major and most successful figures in American you know, intellectual history and political history are on the left. And progressivism is in part an adaptation of social Darwinism, of course, to politics. Uh, and, and then you get the living constitution, which means the one that not the one that spontaneously emerges um, uh, in a biological way, but the one that the experiments of the scientists confirm as, uh, as the most likely to survive. So it's, not, it's artificial selection, not natural selection in, on the, uh, in left, left-wing social Darwinism. But that gets you, I mean, that begins to sound a little bit like um, the, the description that uh, uh, we've heard here uh, about the nature of politics itself. The problem is once, you're, once you, you, know, you start evolution <laughs> and you don't have an end in mind, but, but the end is whatever evolution will bring you to and you, and you have passions, you have opinions which you experiment on in order to help bring about your will to power, uh, you know, that's, uh, that is a very grim and, and anti-civilization future, it sounds like to me. So we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, Jay Richards over there. Okay, maybe this is reductionist, but I guess my inclination um, about the, the over-complaining about rights talk is simply that the, a right is... Uh, just the the flip side of a duty. And so if I have a right, that's a claim to others, which implies a duty. And I just don't see why there's anything problematic about that. The fact that people try to claim their fake rights that aren't real, I just say, that's a stupid right. And in fact, it's probably not even symmetrical or something like that. But um, it just has never seemed problematic to me. And the fact that the progressives sort of overuse rights language to me is just, well, they're just overusing it. But why is that not, why is, what's the problem with that claim? Clearly as conservatives, we don't have the problem of duties, right? We think duties are, are real. So um, why is a right, the real ones, not just the sort of flip side of a duty? 
I actually think that we in Western society have reached the point where it's not clear that there are any duties, that there are any moral or political obligations that are actually binding on people. And it's, um, you, you know, it's, it, it, it's possible that that 100 years ago or 300 years ago, somebody could have constructed a, you know, the kind of thing you're proposing where uh, where duties fit together with rights. I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit skeptical of it just because the only historical experience we have is that the rights multiply and the duties disappear. And that's, um, you know, Selden made this argument in the 1640s, he's one of the great common lawyers, and, and, and he said, it can't be that a promise or, uh, or, or consent or any other kind of voluntary obligation is the source of our, of our duties because the moment that you give that power to human beings, then what's going to happen is that if they have the, the, the ability to take on rights by consent, they also have the ability to get rid of, of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, to, to take on obligations by consent. They also have the right to throw away their obligations by unconsenting. And that, that argument of the common lawyers, I, you know, I, I understand that other arguments are possible, but it seems historically that they were right. That's what's happened. And that our problem is not so much, I mean, this, we have a problem with the profusion of rights, but the real problem is that nobody can figure out where obligation comes from anymore. I, I approve of the, of the spirit of those remarks. Um, but I wonder um, about that, because it seems to me that the, the left, it, when it invents rights, has a very uh, keen idea of, uh, of the duties it's creating at the same time. You have a duty to provide abortions. You have a duty to provide health care. I mean, if you have a right, somebody has a right to health care, that means somebody else has to have the duty to pay for that health care. And gradually, um, rights claims, even of the, of the loose Lockean kind that we have sometimes been discussing, rights vanish um, against the proliferation of duties to serve the new kind, the new programmatic rights of liberalism. And that is the road to serfdom, in a way, that uh, Hayek was worrying about, that in the creation of new socialist rights, essentially, freedom and, uh, and the right to consent to paying taxes and things gradually gets swallowed up. Your duties, you, you become ensurfed again because your, du your duties to provide other people's rights come before your own rights or any objective sense of rights that might limit public authority and not just expand public authority um, so that Peter can enjoy the benefits of Paul's taxes via social programs of one kind or another. Well, thank you very much, Yoram and Charles. Our next uh, set of panels begins at 2.30, so take a moment to uh, get a snack, and then uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.